everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me as always are my intrepid crew. Hello, Rob. It's Diana. And it's Jackie. Well, how are you guys doing tonight? I feel really good. So good. So good. Oh, so yeah. So good. <laughs> I wish the Red Sox uh, overall scores were doing so good. Anyway... This isn't a podcast about baseball or whatnot. This is a podcast about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research. Every week, we choose an exciting topic in the field and review some relevant research articles. Sometimes we even get to have on a special guest. But before I tell you who our special guest is, let's talk about the topic. We're going to be revisiting a topic that we did way back when in what episode? 34. God, that was a long time ago. 34. Uh, We're going to be revisiting the topic of the preschool life skills. So it's preschool life skills, you know, the next generation. I can't get the Star Trek song right now. It'll come to me later. That's Star Wars. Or that might be Superman or Indiana Jones. They kind of all sound the same. I'm really bad at that. So we will be talking all about recent research on preschool life skills and the idea of preschool life skills as maybe... Something we could be using as a proactive means of teaching skills rather than a reactive one. So we'll be talking about three articles tonight. They are Preschool Life Skills, Recent Advancements and Future Directions by Fami and Luzinski. That's in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2018. The Big Four, Functional Assessment Research Informs Preventative Behavior Analysis by Eli Rosales, Sihan, Courier, Ferguson, Leaf, Leaf, McEachin, and Weinkoff. And that's in... Behavior Analysis in Practice 2018. And then finally, we'll be talking about, this is our main article for tonight, Life Skills Instruction for Children with Developmental Disabilities by Robeson, Mann, and Ingverson in the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis. And that's just coming out this year, 2019. And to help us discuss all these advancements in the preschool life skills, we have a very special guest here. So let's introduce Dr. Einar Ingverson. Einar, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Oh, you know, we're we're having a good time. We love talking about PLS. People love hearing about PLS. So we're very, very excited that you are here to, you know, to talk about more PLS. The next generation. The next generation. Yes. I especially appreciate it that you call it the next generation. I, I'm going to use that. <laughs> so you, are you going to be, you'll be the Captain Picard of this episode and, you know, give us our engage signals and all that stuff. If I'm Captain Picard, then Greg Hanley is then... Who is Craig Kenley? Oh, I, uh, so I, I guess I guess Riker. No, no, I guess then it, I guess if, if we're if we're really digging deep, oh. then I guess Greg would be Captain Picard. And our, be you, Kirk. you'd be no, you'd he's be Kirk. Oh, is he Kirk? Yeah. And, okay, and Anar's Picard. Was, okay, that makes more sense. All right, Rob, you That's can what I was right. trying to set up. Okay, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I failed. Wow. Man. I'm Deanna Troy, I guess she's my I'm gonna be uh, Abraham Lincoln on that one episode <laughs> where uh, Captain Kirk and Spock join forces with Abraham Lincoln to fight a rock monster. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be him. I never saw any of these shows, so I'll be that person that vanishes in that little machine. You could be the character that they realized they had too many security officers, yep. so they, they killed Yar her off. Would. Ta- yeah. Tasha Yar. Tasha what? Yar. That's so close. I think that might be a country singer. <laughs> Trisha yeah. Yearwood, yeah. I'll just be that character that vanishes. You're not supposed to be here. We You're an extra many, on a- We can't pay for this many characters. <laughs> You're an extra on a different show. Actually, Jackie, maybe you could be Wesley. You're like, I'm really smart, and I'm really spunky, and no, none of the... I Actually, love your life awesome. character. I love that you are telling me the character, and I'm like, I don't know, I don't watch the show, so I'm giving you blank stare. <laughs> but but that means that I would have to say uh, shout out <laughs> Wesley or shout out Jackie at some point. I don't want to do that. And much like Captain Picard is coming back to the networks, you're well, you're not coming back to our show, but you're here on our show, so you know. Yeah, it's, it it just works so many ways, so many metaphors. So, Adar, why don't you, other than being a space captain, uh, why don't you tell our audience other things that you do in the field of behavior analysis? Yeah, currently I am um, Director of Clinical Services at the Virginia Institute of Autism in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I've been here about two years, and I'm also adjunct faculty at University of Virginia. We just recently started a BCBA master's program there, just finished the first year, so I'm teaching about three classes in that and helping kind of supervise that along with my UVA colleagues. Ooh. And I also have a research collaboration going with my UVA colleagues along with other VIA colleagues. Very nice. Sounds like you're busy. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, it fills out the calendar really nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so, Einar, 
just for for any of our listeners who had not heard our previous episode where we talked about the original preschool life skills study, can you kind of give having having known all about it for for all these years, could you kind of give your quick summary of what the preschool life skills curriculum is was at the time is now? Yeah, it started out uh, really as a response to some research that suggested that uh, at least to a certain extent, being in uh, what they call non-maternal child care or non-familial, non-family child care could actually result in greater risk of problem behavior in the long run. So uh, being in daycare, you might be learning some important skills, but you might also be learning how to control your peers in less desirable ways, is <laughs> one way to put it. So there's observational learning potentially of both desirable and undesirable behavior. So, I mean, that I think being used maybe a little bit politically by some people to suggest that maybe you shouldn't be sending kids to, to child care as much. But I mean, Greg Hanley's advisor at the time, his response was, well, why don't we try to figure out a way to make child care better so that there's less, you know, so we reduce that risk and actually try to prevent the problem behavior. The key idea is really to set up common evocative situations that are likely to result in problem behavior, such as denied access or delayed access to items, you know, lack of attention, being asked to follow instructions, some challenging situations related to peer interactions. And then in that, those situations, when the EO, relevant EO and, and SDs are in place, teach ways to deal with it, you know, pro-social behavior or, you know, compliance or communication and so forth. And do that in a class-wide level. And uh, I don't know how much detail I should go into right now and in terms of the in- intervention procedures, but that's kind of the general gist of it. And the original original study was done with typically developing kids, even though there were also some kids in their classroom with developmental delays. And now recently, uh, myself and some others have started to extend that more in, in the research to, to children with developmental disabilities, although I know in practice people have been doing that already. It's not in the research literature. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. When I first read that preschool, the initial preschool life skills uh, article, I was a little bit like, oh, no, because I had just signed up my child for daycare. And I was like, have fun. It'll be so great for us. Go. Mm-hmm. You learn so many skills. And then I was like, oh, look at that statistic. <laughs> there are going to be so many skills that they're going to learn, but they may not all be the ones I want them to be. <laughs> so then I, I really like that proactive approach. Right. Um, yeah. So far, we don't really have uh, the longitudinal data to, to show us whether that is uh, solving the problem in the long run, but we do have some smaller studies that do show preventative effects. I think you reviewed one of those, Lusinski and Hanley, last yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. That's yeah. one of my favorite studies. Me too. Another thing I when I like to think about it is I think the preschool life skills, how you guys are, are researching it, really uh, speak to people outside of the field of behavior analysis, right? So I have actually done an entire presentation on preschool life skills to daycare teachers. Uh, mm-hmm. and they were so jazzed that we, wait, wait, we can actually teach specific things that we want our kids to do. And I was like, yes. And so what they did when we did the, when we did the training is each classroom actually like from 18 months up chose like a skill they were going to target for the year and everybody was super jazzed about it uh and i like that it expands beyond just our field of behavior analysis yeah it is certainly a well curriculum that i've seen have a lot more grit in public schools (laughs) than a lot of other initiatives almost everyone i've brought up the idea of they might not have gone all the way in in certain terms of like starting up a preschool life skills group but they've been very interested in the ideas. They've been very interested in the idea of, oh, a lot of challenging behavior. They, they don't use the terms, you know, looking for EOs and then the behavior skills training component. They don't use any of the terminology, but they certainly understand how so many skills could be taught by thinking about all of the different kind of delay of reinforcement, all the friendship skills as really just being a matter of something is happening in the environment. And then based on what happens, respond a certain way. And there's a higher chance that you might receive some amount of reinforcement or maybe not, but you do it, you know, you do to start and then it sort of fades out over time. Everyone, everyone gets that, you know, it really is understood by practitioners, by non-practitioners, by all sorts of educators. And I think it really has a lot of, a lot of legs in wherever it's tried. 
Well, I think you bring up a great point there. Is that it is actually pretty easy to describe this in everyday language in in way that appeals to people that care about these things. Einar, I have a, a quick question. It's sort of an in the weeds question. It's not totally germane to the overall episode, but I, I've been thinking about this for for years and years. And I didn't ask Dr. Hanley when I'd originally talked to him about this. I just kind of called him out of the blue to ask for more information. But I want to ask you, because you you were involved in that original study, was there a reason that the term behavior skills training wasn't used in some of those early studies? It, it seems like it has been in the past few studies, in the past few replications. It just wasn't a term that was being used as frequently in the literature. It wasn't thought to really meet the criteria of behavior skills training, something else. You know what? I had never even realized that the term wasn't used in the original study until you pointed it out, you know, in the show notes that you sent me. And um, I actually went and looked at some of the old material. It's it's in the manual that we used, mm-hmm. but it's not in the article. And I have no idea why. Maybe word count. Maybe. It gets you every time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Right. Because I'll, I'll refer students to that article to teach them about behavior skills training sometimes. And then yeah, realize it's not it's not written down in the title. I yeah. mostly just wanted to confirm because I refer to it as behavioral skills training, and then sometimes I'm like, but no. it's not in there. Maybe it's not. Oh God, I don't understand what behavior skills training is. And so I just wanted to confirm. <laughs> and we might get into this in more detail later, but I think it's also this general approach of you know setting up evocative situations, you know, evocative contexts, and uh, teaching. The, the teaching itself, I think, can be done in a variety of ways, and it doesn't necessarily have to be behavioral skills training. And maybe that will be a, some of the research that will be done in the future, because I think that this behavioral skills training approach is not necessarily appropriate for all of the clients that we work with. Mm-hmm. Right. So in terms of our discussion points and our articles that we'll be going over tonight or today or whenever whenever folks are listening to this, I think the the big picture really is the idea that that kind of came out of the original preschool life skills literature is oh, why rather than saying, man, these situations sure are bad. Let's not do this anymore. Why aren't we saying, hey, let's use our technology to be proactive and teach these missing skills or teach these skills that we are concerned about for the future and Make sure that they're in children's repertoire as early as possible or as appropriately as possible. You know, maybe even before, say, challenging behavior or an issue related to one of the original 13 life skills occurs. And this is something that I think in behavior analysis makes sense because we are all a bunch of go-getters who we hear about a problem and we're immediately like, what's in the research? What can we do? But I think in terms of in, – in, in our you, you've probably seen this and, and Jackie Diana, you've probably seen this a little bit too. When we talk about education, there's sort of this – if it ain't – broke don't fix it attitude where you sort of wait until things get really bad and then you ask someone maybe a bcba hey can you fix this problem that's been going on for all this time and no one ever dealt with it until now and you have about a week because everyone's really worried about this giant problem that's (laughs) been going on all this time and and it's a very backward system i think uh, you're absolutely right and i think that's kind of uh, the history of to a large extent of applied behavior analysis that we have been called in when things are really bad. So Mm -hmm. I think that's probably part of the reason why we haven't focused as much systematically on prevention. But now that we, you know, are a bigger field and we're growing and we have those schools and we were, you know, we have early intervention programs where kids are not necessarily just being referred for problem behavior. I think we have an opportunity to build more systematic prevention programs. And I think people have been doing it. I mean, there are um, a lot of programs that I've worked in, for instance, tolerance of denial, you know, is very often a part of the curriculum. But I don't think it's universal, though. I think we could be a lot more systematic about it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the, I I don't know if metaphors, illusions, (laughs) one of the ideas that came up in uh, almost all the articles we're discussing tonight is the idea of the tiered system or the tiered system of support or the tiered system of special education. And this is something that I really was never introduced to until I started working in public schools and people threw around terms like tier one, tier two, tier three intervention. And I would nod, you know, I do what anyone does when they learn a new term, which is I nod my head, I'd smile, they say, yeah, mm -hmm, no, I I understand. And then I'd run back and try to do a Google (laughs) search or look in the literature about what the hell are they talking about so I could look less stupid the next time. That that happened with me with sensory diet, except I didn't nod. I was like, what are you going to feed them? (laughs) And I was in an IEP meeting and it was very embarrassing. (laughs) 
I was like, what kind of food are in your sensory diet? And then everybody... Crunchy food that at makes me sounds. And looked at me and me. I was like, ha, ah, ha, bye. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there you go. To avoid any any of you listeners, any of you behavior analysts out there, to avoid ever being in that situation yourself, we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of the, the tiered model of support. Well, I can kind of talk a little bit about what, what I found useful about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it is useful, for instance, in the context that we had in that school where we ran the Robinson et al. study that we're, we're going to talk about, where we had classrooms where uh, we had, you know, lower than one to one, just half the student ratio. So there is not necessarily group instruction going on in the traditional sense because it's, a you know, individualized behavior analytic instruction. But nevertheless, it is efficient to try something on a group level first, class-wide level first, and the individuals, the students that master the skill, acquire the skill, they're good. They just, it goes into maintenance to go into the next skill. Those that don't, that would be the tier one. Tier two would be then a smaller group, a smaller group of those that did not master the skill uh, in the class-wide instruction. And that, that allows you to have certain criteria. You, you do a certain amount of class-wide instruction. You do a certain amount of, of small group instruction. And then those that have not mastered it at that time they go into one-to-one instruction, uh, maybe with uh, added supports and you know additional intervention components until they master it. Mm-hmm. Now, while this, I think this model does sound like it makes perfect sense in the educational setting. I think one of the issues is some of the skills that are targeted in either preschool life skills or they're targeted in, say, uh, some some of the work on how would you, how how could you avoid individuals learning ch- challenging behavior, maybe you know through through delay tolerance training. Those curricula don't necessarily exist. So when we talk about tier one, the skills that we talk about in the preschool life skills as being taught aren't being taught unless someone like yourself, Dr. Hanley, Dr. Lazinski are coming in and saying, hey, everybody, we're going to do this thing in your classroom. Uh, I'm we're sure it is at times. Yeah, we're going to do a thing. But if someone mm-hmm. is coming from outside, you know, I, I think some of the, the looking at uh, social emotional learning, that seemed to me when I was hearing about it, that seems to be sort of a push in schools. But I think the problem becomes, and there are a lot of articles about this, it's not really being defined as we as behavior analysts would think of it being defined as, oh, that sounds like delay tolerance. That sounds like some of those friendship skills. It's sort of more mushy. And <laughs> than that. So when we think of it as maybe it's going to become a tier one intervention, I don't think a lot of educators are thinking of the skills we'll be talking about today as a part of, say, social emotional learning initiatives. And they, and they really should. I feel like these two topics really dovetail into each other and could really be a great inroads into improving behavior in schools or maybe not longitudinally. We don't know that for sure, but, but it would be at least a good start. Yeah. I'm not familiar with this, this curricula that you're talking about. I do know a lot of, I come from school people, you know, mm-hmm. and I've never heard of, you know, this kind of interventions being done systematically in, in classrooms. So I do think it is something we have to offer as behavior analysts to, yeah. to educate this tiered model made me think of response to intervention, right? RTI. That's, yep, that's where that's where it, it's used mostly. Yeah. It which again is kind of like you, Rob. I had not heard of that, that terminology. I thought it was at those all. video games where you have like mm-hmm. um, all the little soldiers and you send your soldiers out to like fight other soldiers. And it's an RPG. That's a, oh no, it's, a, it's an RTS. It's a real time strategy <laughs> game. It could be an RPG like Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> None of which really relate <laughs> to the idea of an RTI. <laughs> okay. But I had not heard, like, throughout my entire behavior analytic schooling, I had not heard of RTI or response to intervention Me neither. or a tiered model. So Me it, neither. it's good, I think, for BCBAs who are listening to this to maybe hear some of those terms. But I think RTI is generally used when it's the general curriculum in the classroom, and then they evaluate whether there is additional instruction needed. But the difference here mm-hmm. is it's using a similar tiered model, but there isn't an existing social emotional curriculum like the preschool life skills already in place in the classrooms yeah and, and gosh wouldn't it be great if it was already there that becomes yeah that becomes the problem and i know since the original study there's been a lot of growth in what preschool life skills could look like so certainly looking at smaller group size instruction rather than the whole group luzinski and hanley in 2013 uh was it did we talk about this article i can't remember mm-hmm. i should yeah. have gone back and looked <laughs> yeah we did. uh setting up the performance based criteria rather than sort of the just kind of the, the general probes in the original study 
looking at the progress- a progressively increasing intertrial interval. Francisco and Hanley 2012. And again, I'm just throwing out the citations because we won't get into too much detail so on those. fancy. What do you mean? The citations. The just cita- throwing them out there. I'm just throwing them out there. The use of supplemental awards with preschool life skills that was uh, used in Ballou and Hanley in 2014. Einar, before we get into our articles for this episode, are there any other kind of extensions or good replications of preschool life skills that you feel we should at least mention? There's one very recent one, which was International Replication in Ireland, which was published in uh, European Journal of Behavior Analysis. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I could remember all of the authors. Let me see if I can. It was, um, oh yeah, I think I actually have it here. It was Gunning, Holloway, and Healy, evaluating the preschool life skill programs to teach school readiness skills on Irish palate study in European Journal of Behavior Analysis. Sure. So that was kind of similar to the Hanley et al. 2014 study where they replicated it in a Head Start classroom. Mm-hmm. Consultative, is that, am I saying that right? Model. I think yeah. so. Consultative. Yeah. Consultative. Oh. Maybe. Consultative model. Where, so they basically had the preschool teachers run it themselves, but they were there as consultants. One interesting thing they did in that study, they had a control group that didn't receive the intervention. And they also had a second control group that was actually in the same children were there in the same classroom as the intervention group. So they could observe the other children engaged in the skills, but they did not receive the training. And they were not different from the other control, control group at all. So it's not enough just to be in that environment. You have to actually receive the training. There was I, I can't remember. I, I feel like it might have been cited in one of these, but there was something related to other social skills for kids with autism. And I, I cannot remember the citation at all. But the key factor had less to do with making the training look exactly the same in the pullout session as in the natural environment as it did to just make sure that hey, you know the stuff we're doing in the pullout session? Everyone else should probably be doing that too. You know, setting up the situations, giving feedback, allowing for multiple opportunities for practice, providing some amount of, you know, positive social reinforcement. I think that jives with a lot of other other research too. If it's not good enough to just have kids, <laughs> have some kids practice and other kids watch. Watching is... Yeah. <laughs> I think you're probably referring to the uh, Lusinski, Hanley, and Rodriguez study, 2013. Oh, so, okay. Well, that, may, that may be, yes. Yeah, what they found found there was exactly that. And, and and specifically, if the teachers in the generalization settings received some training on what skills are we looking for, what should we be reinforcing, what should we be setting up, much greater likelihood of generalization and maintenance. Mm. Not, yeah, that's not really that surprising. It jives certainly with what we know, what we know about generalization and maintenance. Yeah. yeah, and about BSD. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do that real quick. So, so we'll call yeah. watching other people do these things. That's tier zero. That's not too not super effective. <laughs> you didn't even get on yeah. to the stairs <laughs> yet. <laughs> Just want to pause real quick before we continue our conversation to let you know ABA Inside Track is ACE approved, and we just got renewed, so we're continued to be ACE approved. Phew. Oh, thank God. If you are interested in getting continuing education credits for listening to ABA Inside Track, all you have to do is, number one, listen to the episode. And then number two, go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen CEUs. And there you can choose this episode and put in some important information like the two secret code words we'll have hidden in the episode. And the first of those is friendship, F R. I E N D S H I P. You're like, how do I spell that? It's I before E except after C. Friendship. If you leave out the N, your friend will be fried. That's oh. true. That's how I always remembered it. There's only one ship sad. I want to travel on. It's the friendship, which is actually a boat. You can see it in Salem, Massachusetts. If they're not redoing it or whatever, usually it's closed. Friendship. We heard ghost stories on there once. It was really cool. Ainar, why don't since we have you, we 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 should probably pick your brain on the article you shared, the Robinson Man and and you article <laughs> that is <laughs> that is in in press right now, or it's about no, to no, it's no, it did it's come in. out. It's out. It's, it's, it's out. out. It's out. Okay. Yeah. I made my notes a little while ago. So. It's, it's here. It's ready for <laughs> consumption. Awesome. So, where did you come up with the thought of? How, how that research was going to look. What was that process like? A few years ago, and uh, I hadn't really been thinking about preschool life skills for a while. I had been focusing a lot on um, verbal behavior research and uh, some other problem behavior research. 
it was really those the, my two co-authors, Melinda and Tracy, that kind of reignited my interest in it. And uh, Melinda was my student and was a master student at the time, and this is her thesis. She's now a behavioral analyst. She actually runs the behavior disorders clinic at the Child Study Center, which is now a Cook Children's Child Study Center in Fort Worth. Wow, good for her. Great. And Tracy Mann is the director of the school at that center. Mm-hmm. And we actually went to Kansas together, grad students together, and she had worked with Greg Conley there too. That was kind of kind of a no-brainer, right? thinking back, that, you know, given that she was running that school and I was right there, you know, working in a different program in the same center, early, you know, the early intervention autism program, but we were working together on a lot of stuff, obviously. So we had those classrooms and we could, do what we wanted, so why not do this? <laughs> That's awesome. That sounded kind of bad. Sorry. No, it actually is true, though, right? Like that's how it happens. Like you're like, oh, yeah. I've come across. That's what Skinner told us to do. Come across the situation <laughs> and do what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's we, Skinner. We thought it would be beneficial for the students to exactly. receive this program. Yeah. Right? It's such a functional end product <laughs> that you end up with here, and in, in yeah. Classroom yeah. teachers likely were really interested in working on these proactive social skills too, so it, it's a win-win. Yeah. So Melinda was actually running that classroom at the time, and it was a fairly new classroom. It was created as a transition classroom between the early intervention program and the school. Okay. Not all necessarily all of the students in that classroom participated. Some of them came from other classrooms, and we just created groups to, to implement the program. In that in that classroom, but everything that hap- it happened in it was consistent with the, you know, practices of that classroom. And jumping ahead a little bit, they didn't stop af- after this because Tracy has now implemented this as a part of the curriculum of the entire school, all seven to eight classrooms. And she has actually expanded the curriculum quite a bit, added uh, intervention targets that are more appropriate to older kids and oh, wow. collected a lot of data. And it's really, it's really awesome. So that's oh, that, that's more on just more the extension that. and how you would how you would expand those initial skills across the different settings, which I think a mm-hmm. lot of the, the previous research had talked about. Wouldn't it be great if we knew that? So uh, excellent! Mm-hmm. Sounds like some of that data is going to be coming out. That's great. Unfortunately, I mean, we didn't really have any funding to do this. This was just a master's thesis. I left kind of quickly thereafter, so uh, I don't know if we have publication level data, but we certainly have some data. Maybe we can do something with it. At least we have a great model. Mm-hmm. I know, like that. Brother. I'm in. Yeah. You sold me. <laughs> yeah. In terms of looking at what the so it wasn't the preschool life skills, it was just it was just the life skills, right? It was just it took out the P. So it was more for for other students with developmental disabilities. Yeah, I mean it seems kind of weird to call it preschool life skills now that we started to include a lot of participants that are not preschool age. Sure. So uh yeah, life skills is what we're going with right now. We might touch upon this later, Greg Conley and his group have also created something they call the Balance Program, mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. which is kind of similar to this, except it's a parent training model. Okay. Not hasn't been published yet, to my knowledge. I think they just collected some data. Yeah, life skills or balance, you know, I think we'll, we'll figure out a catchy name at some point. The only problem with life skills is it sounds like you're doing some sort of like an ADL program or a job, you know, vocational seeking program when you just refer to life skills. It's a little, I know. Too, little too vague. But again, as an extension of preschool life skills, makes perfect sense in the context of the, yeah. of the, of the article itself. Yeah, I think we, we might need to be a little bit more specific in, in future articles. I think you're right about that. We've got the setting. You've got the students who also are serving as the teacher and the researchers. When you were kind of setting up the initial, or when, when Robeson and Mann were setting up the initial settings and talking about all this with you, what were the key components of the original research or the extensions of research that you all felt these are going to have to be a part of this study? Was or, or, or was it more kind of on the fly as things worked, didn't work? No, it was pretty much uh, delivered exactly as planned. It, it was the rare project that goes that way. <laughs> it just goes exactly, pretty much exactly the way it was planned from the beginning. So, yeah, the essential components are obviously setting up those evocative situations that you're teaching in. And sticking with the original class-wide approach as the tier one, which starts with circle time with all the kids where you introduce the skill and you model it and you role play it in the circle. And we also added visual prompts, which were not in the original study. 
Mm -hmm. Basically as a supplementary prompt. And really the only reason for that was just the whole literature on instruction with uh, individuals with developmental disabilities that visual prompts are often helpful as supplementary prompts. That was really the whole, and just our our clinical experience, educational experience in that setting as well. Mm. We use those visual prompts through all those tiers. So yeah, after that initial circle time, then you do individual trials in play areas. So you set up basically a teaching skill such as, you know, responding to one step instruction. You set up situations in what we're calling the play centers in the classroom where instructions are being delivered and, and so forth. So we do the X number of trials of that. Then we do a probe where we basically test whether they can do the, the skill without prompting. And I should mention that the uh, teaching is done according to behavioral uh, skills training, like we just said. Give an instruction model the skill, give them an opportunity to pr- perform, then you give correct feedback if necessary, repeat. Mm-hmm. And so if they pass the probe, which, uh, you know, um, which is just two or three trials, depending on how they did. So they needed to get, you know, two trials correct. They would move on to the next one. Otherwise, they would go to tier two and so forth and so on. And tier two was just the exact same, just with a smaller group. So tier three was just one to one. So it was no small group, you know, sorry, no, no circle time. It was just the visual prompt still, still the behavioral skills training. And uh, we did six trials at a time, but where we used this progressively increasing into trial interval approach, uh, Francisco and Hanley, their article described that, which meant that there, it starts with very short intervals between the trials and then they become progressively longer. If I, as I recall, it was what, three, 10, 30 seconds and then two, four, 16 minutes. Mm-hmm. So the idea there is basically to capitalize on both the strengths of mass trials and distributed learning. You know, both have strengths, Mm -hmm. but distributed trials can help with maintenance of of skills and retention. More more likely to get it right the next time, basically. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, and I think Mm -hmm. having it proceduralized as needed would be very helpful if one were to use this program with you know teachers Mm -hmm. who had less training or was in a full consultative model. Because if you just say, so start off and run a few really close together and then kind of sprinkle it through the day, you're it. pretty yeah. much setting up, uh, I'll do a couple right away and then I'll forget to do, <laughs> to do it until they, until the kids aren't actually engaged in the skill properly. And then I might fall back on my old patterns of behavior, which would be things like, Billy, you're not doing it right. Why aren't you? We just talked about this at Circle. Don't you remember? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. I like the way it has built in intervals so that you need to. I know. I want to go back in and I gotta, I gotta again. go snip that part out of the research and write it down myself because I know, I know, I've been guilty of the whole do a lot to start and then kind of do it a with a little bit. bit more of a delay, and then I, I, but I don't proceduralize it in the extent that I need to. So I, mm-hmm. I got to go back and, and look at these these again myself and, <laughs> and copy that down. Yeah, and whenever yeah. incidental teaching, I think it's important to like emphasize the action part that's needed on the part of the teacher or the therapist. Otherwise. The therapist sometimes will say, well, the situation never arose, right? So I never prompted yeah. that skill. But you have to establish the situation and establish the EO so that you can then prompt the skill. So having more proceduralization to assist with that, even though it is in a more naturalistic setting, is uh, probably key. Yeah. And helpful for newer staff, right, that don't yeah recognize that they need to do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That, that is, you know, one of the trickiest parts. Maybe, maybe the part that is the least intuitive to a lot of people is the contriving of those evocative situations. Yeah, mm. I think so. But it's just something to practice. It becomes just like a second nature if you just practice it enough. Mm. It, is, it can be a little awkward at first because you're really kind of setting up the kids to have some difficulty. You know, you're, you're giving them an instruction to get something and then somebody is standing in the way and, ter- and has their back turned on them and they have to tap them on the shoulder and say, excuse me, and get their attention and then ask for the item. You know, uh, it's not something that uh, adults are likely to do just out of the blue with kids. You know, it, it is something that has to be programmed and, and, and taught and trained. Yeah. I mean, it's it certainly when, you, when you're working with children, really with any children, but especially with children who have developmental disabilities, then a lot of these skills haven't just come naturally or yeah. the diagnosis is, well, they don't learn some of these skills naturally or through environmental mm-hmm. learning or observational learning without mm-hmm. specific procedures in place. And it's so funny how, kind of like we talked about, it's nobody thinks about it as a problem that this child doesn't know how to tap someone on the shoulder and say, excuse me, 
until Mm -hmm. why are they always screaming and yelling or why are they always using these inappropriate behaviors to get my attention? Oh, we didn't bother to teach them to ask for attention. But, you know, unfortunately, they're 14 or 15. We probably should have done that back when they were, say, seven or eight or six or five. One of the interesting kind of findings of the study was the denial and delay skills were a little bit harder to teach with this population. Mm. So, so they were more likely to, to take greater number of trials to, to teach than, than the instruction following or, or functional communication or friendship skills. That might not be replicated in other studies. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, it kind of fits with my general feeling that tolerance of denial and delay are very important and sometimes neglected skills with that population that can have great effect on their future success in other environments. Well, I actually had a question about that, Einar, in terms of the findings that you all had in terms of like skill 911, you know, the delay, delay tolerance seemed to be a, a tricky skill, but mm. friendship skill, the overall one. So, you know, saying hi when someone joined the group, sharing an item with them didn't seem to require as much intervention or as intense a level of intervention. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I've always struggled with when I've kind of replicated PLS with groups, usually groups of ch- you know children, preschool children with either mild or moderate autism, is how hard the friendship skills were. You know, and I, I remember I, I've taught uh, multiple special educators. Quick shout out to one of my colleagues, Colleen Callahan, who loved preschool life skills, always had it, you know, running in her classrooms. I think she still has it going to this day. But when we get to friendship skills, we'd have the kids, they'd master everything. They'd get through their, you know, the, the original study used uh, probes, but the 2007 study used those probes. They'd master their probes. And we'd get to friendship skills and the kids would just tank them. They just never pay attention. It was just so frustrating because the kids would come over to play. And it was like when they were the kid joining the group, they understood someone's supposed to say hi to me and share a toy. But the Mm -hmm. kids who were playing never bothered to look up or share the toy. And we'd practice it and practice it and practice it. And maybe we didn't practice it enough. But um, sounds like you did. (laughs) It feels like it's all the research. They make it seem like friendship skills should be the easiest one. And I've always found it to be the hardest the hardest yeah. one because you're diverting attention. Yeah. I think there was another study that came out uh, just before ours that, that was also with children with developmental disabilities. That was Phallic Gunt and Pence, 2017. As I recall, they didn't even touch the friendship skills in that study. They, they only focused on the instruction following functional communication and tolerance mm-hmm. skills. So the children that you're talking about, had, had they had early intervention for some time or were they kind of new to behavioral procedures it really it was it was very different from student to student it was a, it yeah. wasn't earlier it, it was a, it was a preschool so some kids did have actual early intervention before then for some kids it was their <laughs> first time joining a school they really were sort of all different levels you know sort of our, our call for whether they joined our group usually had to do with sort of were they progressing on say a vb map did they engage in challenging behavior so they had a number of the prerequisites we would expect to see yeah. um, but even some of our really high functioning kids who you know would go on to be in full inclusion later on in life, they really couldn't pick up on that skill. And and again, don't know if it was because, you know, they were good preschool toys that no one wanted to stop looking at, or whether yeah. we weren't running it as much and didn't get the same dosage as say, ask for attention, which, you know, just anecdotally, I know the RBTs in the classroom or the, or the BTs in the classroom would usually pay more attention to things like you're not asking appropriately, they give more feedback on remember, you have to ask me appropriately, they'd have the kids wait more often. So it may have just been an issue of dosage, they just didn't practice it as much. Because, again, yeah. they were mostly either in group instruction or they were in one-to-one instruction. So I think that middle tier where they were getting to play with instruction didn't happen quite as much. So that might have been it, too. Yeah, I think uh, I, I don't really have a good an- answer for you, un- unfortunately. I, I'm not surprised, though, that would be a challenge with some children with developmental disabilities. It might have been you know, because of the history of those participants we had in that study that uh, they had just, because they, mo- most of them came from our early intervention program, that they had had some related skill acquisition before that helped with, although clearly they didn't have the skills in baseline, you know, in, yeah. our, in our state. Yeah. yeah. That's just, I, I think it's important, you know, even though the friendship skills, you know, in the, the previous study you mentioned, they didn't look at friendship skills, anything related to play i think those are skills that you're you're working on with the young kids cuz once you get yeah. to a student with a disability in you know third mm-hmm. grade fourth grade the opportunities mm-hmm. for play unless you're engaging in complex verbal behavior just sort of fall by the wayside in the educational mm-hmm. setting so if you haven't even set up those hey share you know those, those some of those basics 
it mm-hmm. really just feels like such a not, not insurmountable but you know again oh this kid needs a tier two tier three intervention but again what's mm-hmm. the curriculum that they're supposed to go do because nobody's playing with toys at that yeah. age you know? the whole nature of social interaction and social relationships changes yeah. pretty soon and just the complexity of those skills needed and the types of relationships that one is expected to maintain is a very yeah. steep incline mm-hmm. from and, uh, on up so play is uh, interesting and it's sort of like a avenue that's running parallel to social skills but at some point in time you just have to kind of like jump back over into the social skills mm-hmm. versus the play mm-hmm. skills specifically mm-hmm. that's yeah i think you know the, the friendship skills in the pls program are pretty rudimentary they're they're kind of like a start and maybe that just needs to be its own program. I mean, that's kind of one of one of my plans is to uh, adopt this further for this kind of setting and for like you know our, our setting here at the at Vaya. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one of the ideas that I have is really just to kind of split it up a little bit. Friendship and social skills would be would be a separate program because I think it just it needs more. It yeah. definitely needs more. Yeah, you could break that mm-hmm. down in so many different ways mm-hmm. it's quite different from sort of the classroom compliance skills mm-hmm. and friendship skills those are operating in much different ways for many kids so many manuals that we could have we could make our oh, so a whole library of manuals yeah i also wanted to mention uh just in that context a little bit more about that Balikant and penn study that, that was the other study with children with developmental disabilities uh, which came out a little bit before ours and actually used the tiered approach the the response to intervention approach also so they basically had the same idea that we did at the same exact same time right which is not unique in the history of science and the variables you know converge in different areas sometimes in the same way but when it happens to you it feels very unique yeah <laughs> yeah but anyway they, so i didn't uh, they know had... about this study but i do know sasha so this is uh cool yeah. that, that they're doing this work too and this was published in behavior analysis research and practice i just looked it up exactly and uh, they had they had fewer children, they had fewer skills, and they also had greater variability in the outcomes. They had some of the kids that had you know very similar outcomes to to the kids in our study, okay. but they also had a couple that had much greater difficulty with acquiring the skills and uh, required tier three with all the skills. So I think there were two kids that required tier three with all the skills, which was never the case in our study. Mm-hmm. But they also did not use visual prompts and they did not use uh, progressively into trial into trial intervals. So that might have something to do with it. But I think it's a very, very good study. And it, it uh, suggests to me the potential difficulties in translating this program to this population. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. And there's such a wide range of, of kids that yeah. might be served within this this group. So mm-hmm. one would mm-hmm. expect to see some kids respond, I would think, at each tier level. Yeah. All right, everyone, let's take a quick break, and then we'll be right back to talk more about preschool life skills. The next generation. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass., to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there! And we are back talking with our special guest, Dr. Einar Engvarsson, all about the preschool life skills and the next generation of research related to this awesome, awesome curriculum. So let's continue on. 
I guess one of the things that we probably should talk about, and maybe we want to just move into Dissemination Station. I, I don't want to go too early going away from the research, but I feel like there are a lot of great avenues for replication, extension, yeah. and sort of big picture planning that I want to make sure that we give enough time to sort of breathe and discuss. There it is. Oh, good. I hope I hope you heard the sound, the great sound effects we have from Foley artist uh, Jackie McDonald over here. Hi, welcome to my studio. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> if you want me to make a hi sound, I can do that too. Nice. Uh, you already kind of talked a little bit about future future directions, Anar. So so you're looking at more replications. Are there other kind of components of PLS or LS, whatever we want to call it, research? that you think is going to be important to include in some of those future replications that kind of off the top of your head? I think there's a number of things. One is, I think the generalization needs to be looked at in more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been a little bit of that. I mean, the Lusinski, Hanley, and Rodriguez study, the Falcon Penn study, they, they did look at generalization with varying outcomes. But, you know, generalization, you know, across settings, people, and also two just different situations that are kind of have some of the components but they may maybe not all of them you know and learn a little bit more about how we can really program for a generalized repertoire and obviously the long-term outcomes whether it, where it actually does prevent problem behavior so that's going to require some grant funding you know and me, me and one of my collaborators uh Bergen, who we just talked to recently on the mm -hmm. podcast an issue we, we have been trying to obtain some funding to do that in Iceland and we already have done some research there in preschools there replicating it implemented by a classroom teacher in a preschool mm -hmm. um, as a master's thesis of a student of, of hers uh, Baura is her name I read it it was good I was one of her reviewers on her master's thesis oh nice, oh, nice. yeah good let's, let's see what else I think in the individuals you know uh, that for whom this kind of behavioral skills training, relying on, you know, instructions and role play and that kind of stuff might not be the best approach, but might still benefit from some of the components of the program. Mm -hmm. Exploring, you know, more kind of incidental teaching, shaping different kind of prompt fading procedures that could be incorporated, mm -hmm. maybe in a, as a part of a, a RTI approach. That, that's one avenue. And I think also just program survival which is basically, will people continue to use this mm -hmm. program after we, to the experts or the people that are really invested leave? So I know, you know, Tracy Mann is using the program at Child Study Center, because, because, but she's running the place and she's really invested. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's funny. You know, would, I, don't, I don't know. Have other people done that? Have, you know, has it survived in other places? Uh, you know, I hear right. stories, encouraging stories, but... Uh, that and the longitudinal effects, those are very difficult, it's very difficult research to do. Yeah. Side note, we've actually tried to do something very similar uh, and have tried to get some grant funding for some extensions for integrated classrooms with the preschool life skills and more of like uh, focusing on the friendship skills. Not yet, but maybe this round. Did we'll you let guys you know. use the term social emotional learning in your grant? No. I'm but telling you, there's a pro, pro tip to. for anyone who's writing a grant who wants to look at this. <laughs> Right, social emotional learning in the grant. I feel like anyone who's doing anything with education, okay, you know, but uh, like minimizing like the gap between beacon. children with special education and and regular education students, any use those terms because all I hear, all I see in my little like every every week, I get like my little Ed week, like here's what's hot in education and special education. It's always SEL, SEL, SEL. Okay. And then you read about it, and you're like, nobody knows what this is. This oh, is a made-up like made term. English language. No, that's ESL. Oh. <laughs> okay, so now I know. I'm My gonna... bad. We thought behavior analysis was bad at their acronym. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix it in this round. Okay. Okay. Uh, if I fix it in this round, I it gets approved. Then I'm not sure what we'll do. I just wrote all of this down. We'll just okay, okay. rob all the credit, I guess. No, I, I'll but write I, my own paper using terminology to get more grant funding. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have brought up some really great points, Adar. And a long time ago, we, we did an episode on the good behavior game. And yeah. Rob brought up 
that it's been termed behavioral inoculation to be exposed to the good behavior game, which is like a really interesting idea, right? So like you mm-hmm. are part of this, you learn hopefully how to work cooperatively with your classroom, mm-hmm. you see some of the effects of your behavior and you have that meet contingencies and that's supposed to kind of last you throughout life. But they did some longitudinal studies on that in order to be able to say such a thing, which sounds kind of crazy, but I feel like PLS, uh, particularly the preschool version if they could get that longitudinal data and saw something similar, then they could start making those same types of claims. Because to me, preschool life skills has an even stronger case than the good behavior game that they're starting early and teaching some of those fundamentally important social skills that are needed to like have success in life. So if someone is working on that longitudinal study already, then that's great. And if not, then hopefully you and Berglund can get on it because I think that those data could be really valuable and could Mm -hmm. again just help us expose our fields to other areas in which we could be of service to our communities especially as tier one and tier two interventions PLS is I I don't want to say so easy to to minimize sort of the impact but it's it makes so much sense we're going to have a center we're going to discuss a rule everyone you know the the teachers already do that in preschool most Mm -hmm. of the time (laughs) And then it's just the amount of practice that needs to happen and just setting up those opportunities, especially when you're using it in a larger group. I think you would find similar results even to, to the ones from your study, Anar, where a lot of the students learned a lot of the skills just from that tier one practice. I'll even more learned it if they needed the tier two practice. And I, I did appreciate how detailed the study was in terms of talking about what happens when a kid is sick or what happens when they miss the lesson, <laughs> yeah. uh, because that that's kind of the practical information that I, I don't always see in a research study because, you know, participants either come or they don't come and then they're out. But th- this being a school setting had to be a, had to be a component of Billy was sick. So he's mm-hmm. got to start at tier two because we already moved on to the next components. So I did really like that. It felt very lived in, you know, the, the article. <laughs> yeah, we're pretty like detail oriented. <laughs> uh, and I was wondering if you thought it would be worthwhile to do that component analysis of what you guys have done now for your study. And tearing out the little pieces of, like, what you think is necessary and sufficient for those, like, visual prompts. And how much or how little. Yeah, maybe. Maybe Um, Or maybe is it not? (laughs) Maybe it's not, right? Like, and that's okay, too. I think just purely from a research perspective, it would be interesting, yes. I think if you're thinking about, like, cost-benefit of what is it worth doing, it might be. But would we be able to figure out under, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure... Additional prompting is going to be needed with some participants right. who develop disabilities. Yeah. And are you going to be able to figure out, like, under what conditions, which prompts are? I mean, there are already some literature on, you know, evaluations on which prompts are effective with each uh, client and so mm-hmm. forth. So right. that could certainly maybe inform those kind of decisions. But I think just in general, yes, if we're going to be figuring out the most efficient ways and, and least effortful ways to implement this in all sorts of settings, then yes, we should definitely be doing all kinds of research on which prompts and which teaching procedures are most effective and efficient, for sure. And I was thinking of wondering if the visual prompts are going to be really hard to fade or if it's necessary to fade them, right? So if they're necessary and sufficient, will they then have to be a component of that programming in order for those behaviors to, to increase? So as you get like older and older and older and you're working on more complex skills, will those visual prompts still need to be present in a classroom where it may not be as appropriate? Well, when you talk about some of the visuals, some of them are just going to be visuals of the rules. Like, you know, every classroom at a certain age has the ABCs. Every classroom at a certain age has, you know, certain tips about, uh, you know, how, what do you do when you're finished with your work? Yeah, you know, where true. should you classroom go? Classroom rules are like so on the wall. I right. think having those rules visual, and, and that's a component of a lot of classroom management systems. Not right. necessarily great classroom management systems, but almost all of them have. Right. What are the rules of the classroom? Posting them visually, you know, letting but kids agree on But then when you move vocationally, those things aren't present, right? So no, when you go to true. your job, do you are you still expecting them to do the same sort of skills, right? So mm-hmm. there isn't those visual prompts, and then are we going to be requiring job sites to post those things? Well, so I, so but I think that would be looking. I mean, for a lot of these skills, we'd be looking at the younger, looking at the younger kids to start. You know, looking yeah, at right. the idea of the tiered model, mm-hmm. the response to intervention. And again, you guys can shoot this down and say, that's the worst idea ever, Rob, because I'm no researcher, but I would think, uh, like you were talking about, Anar, in terms of the cost-benefit, showing the benefit to the most 
number of students in a classroom. So the tier one and even the tier twos of it all would be, I would think, the best way to demonstrate that there is a value in pursuing this as a curriculum that is a part of most classrooms, a part of most programs, because we know that there'll be a certain number of students, like we've been talking about, that aren't going to respond to the tier one and the tier two. They're going to need the tier three intervention. And then we are looking at, well, what else do we have other than delayed practice, the visual prompts, modeling, video model? You know, we, ha- we have a lot of other technology right, that might not be systematized the same way as a tier one and tier two would be. But if you could demonstrate a utility, like look at this classroom of little kids. What jerks? They didn't use the PLS, but this one did, and they're all little angels. And what jerks? <laughs> or whatever the technical term would be for what jerks. Then you really could get those inroads, and then you'd have the maximum benefit. Or, or you'd, you'd have, maybe not maximal benefit, but you'd have a, a greater benefit. Right. Yeah. I think uh, that, that's an interesting, those are interesting points. Uh, I just want to point out, though, that in our study, the Visual prompts were only present during teaching, never during the probes. Right. Oh, I love that. I think I missed so all, that. Uh-huh. So all the, da- all the data that you see in, in figure one, those are all without the visual prompts or the first you know, figure that shows the data. But it's, it is an interesting idea, though, to have some sort of visual reminders present in classrooms to possibly help with you know, maintenance of the skills. Uh, over time. So that could potentially be useful. And, and like you said, it, it might possibly be in line with the culture of those classrooms. Yeah, I think if we were to try to break this down as far as a component analysis, to me, maybe the more useful way to think about this would be what are the prerequisite skills that students may need in order to learn at tier one, tier two, or tier three? And then you could apply that to learning something in a PLS mm-hmm. model. One of the nice things about PLS is so many of those initial skills, though, I think really line up with what you might see with the, working with a child, with, you know, yeah, serious challenging right. behavior, you know, very little verbal behavior. Well, what are the first things we're going to teach? We're going to teach them to wait for things. We're going to teach them basic functional communication. We're going to teach them the basics of gaining attention of an, you know, other individual. That, that, I mean, that touches a little bit on the the uh, the Eli Rosales article talking about uh, yeah. Hey, we can we could do this with certain skills. Why aren't we doing this for challenging behavior? Although I think PLS only got like a very brief mention in that article, which I thought was weird because I, I thought she was going to go much more into the idea of look at look at how PLS already has so many right. of those potential yeah. cusp for no challenging behavior in the right. future skills. I'm wondering because it doesn't look at the function either of behavior, so you're. Mm-hmm. But, but that know. article didn't look at the function either. No, the whole point of that right. article was you don't need to know the function. Right. I mean, you, you know the function of most challenging behaviors. Yeah. What if we taught replacement skills proactively? Right. Yeah, you're right. I think the magic of PLS is really that it brings to light and highlights that we can teach pro-social skills that everyone just takes for granted and mm-hmm. expects that kids are going to learn how to do without actively requiring teaching but they don't actually learn those things without requiring teaching. And to me, that should be the future direction of this area. Like, what other things are we expecting people to learn how to do that w- they would highly benefit from doing in a classroom setting or and then moving on beyond that as well, but they were not actually teaching them? Like, problem-solving skills or critical thinking skills or cultural competence or emotional intelligence skills, like all of those types of things. Could we apply this type of model like operationally define those things and then apply this type of model to that and in doing so kind of help to carve out a little corner of that market for behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. I like that. And then it would be addressing a need that, you know, people are filling without credentials to support what they're doing, right? I just saw camp for social emotional Mm -hmm. learning and executive functioning skills, Mm -hmm. right? And it's just a summer camp and it's like put on by some random person that doesn't do anything related to that yeah, mm. yeah so yeah. that's scary and it was like four thousand dollars that's too much it's a lot of money <laughs> so. yeah i think you know uh, the a lot of Salas study they do cite several of the follow-up studies to pls throughout in support of their points mm. so i think even if they don't mention pls itself until the very end they're they're very much i think taking that literature into account at least that's how i look at it mm. i think this is a pretty good kind of position statement slash call to arms about the time has come. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, you know, yeah. we, 
we have reached the point in, in applied behavior analysis where we can do a lot more of these. We know so much from, you know, for instance, the functional analysis and functional communication training literature that we can apply just like other fields have, not just in a reactive way, but in a, in a preventative way. And we can, you know, be much more systematic and upfront about it, really building it into our curricula. You know, most of the curricula that we use in early intervention and in autism do contain some of those components, you know, mm-hmm. but maybe I think, like I said earlier, uh, it could be a lot more systematic. And I think the framework they come up with there, one thing that I think is kind of missing from it is, is instruction following a little bit. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I think it is it's 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 a good like framework. And I like that. I also like the way the word they they use like you know friendly language. Right. Yeah. Which I think is pretty important. Yeah, we just did a survey for uh, preschool children's parents and asked mm-hmm. them like, what are your top three things that you you feel like uh, your kids don't do that you'd want them to do? And instruction following is like right up there. So mm-hmm. oh. that might oh, be yeah. nice. We all know that, right? But that mm-hmm. might be yeah. nice to kind of beef up a little bit there yeah yeah just just for 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 listeners the big four focus areas that are mentioned in the the Eli Rosales are the idea of we should just plan everyone's going to learn these skills everyone's going to learn to communicate their wants and needs which I mean if if you're a behavior analyst you, you you've been doing that for years I'm sure everyone should be able to gain the attention and affection of others and and there was some kind of nice friendly language they refer to you know joyfully playing with with items the idea of engaging in activities and alone and with others and then again you know cope tolerate and accommodate adversity in situations so we could have called it delay tolerance but i think that one is is the more flowery of the term and and really linking them into these these global goals and they they even mentioned the idea of that proactive teaching of many of these skills would align with say the the un convention on rights of the child which i i haven't read those myself so it was nice <laughs> to see them uh, mentioned in in the article um, yeah well, I think also from a much more practical standpoint, I think those of us in the field that are, you know, uh, working in, in services funded by health insurance, a lot of these, I think all of these can probably be framed in, in the context of working on communication goals, mm-hmm. uh, just in terms of getting them, getting them paid for, you know, and, and approved in treatment plans and so forth. Because it all, it all centers on, you know, even when you're, when you're working on denial tolerance and delay tolerance it starts with a man you know mm-hmm. you're denying a man or you're delaying it so it is still communication training you know instruction yeah. following is still you know it falls within that same category it, it's it's language you know in every, every day term so yeah i think it is something that we can do as, as practitioners for instance those that are working early intervention in autism they could incorporate this this viewpoint this of this approach into what they're doing yeah Ainar, in terms of like big you know kind of continuing on with the big picture i mean do you think the tiered model is something that behavior analysis should really be i, I don't want to say pushing but really looking at in terms of our future planning you know rather than um you know diana you have that great the great metaphor of or the simile of behavior analysts as the as the it guy people don't really only call us when something's broken and they need us to fix it as quickly as possible and then they kind of want us to go away but in our do you think perhaps that this might be a, a nice inroads into you know making our field we, we know it's useful we know we can do so many you know help accomplish so many great things with folks but maybe make what we do make sense as a proactive means rather than a reactive means and what do you think I certainly hope so. I really, <laughs> I really do. I mean, that that would that would be awesome. I actually think this aspect of talking about this in everyday language and using those kind of warmer words is actually a very important component of getting people to buy into this and disseminating it. Mm-hmm. You might may be aware that you know Critchfield and Derek Reed and others have been writing a lot recently about that. Mm-hmm. So, particular thing and the importance of that yeah we did a study dave jamal which and i back in you know 2008 or whatever when we looked at looked at that in terms of in, in staff training context and finally people are citing that now all of a sudden people are interested in that 10 years later you're like thank <laughs> gosh nobody cited that for like seven eight years no, it is great. thanks tom Pritchard. <laughs> i mean that's sincerely but, but anyway, I, I, I really hope so. And I think this is something that people could 
buy into because it like you said it just it makes sense and uh, i think it really does fit into what what a lot of people want to do anyway it's well, heavy I, we, I, I, it's I, good. I positive. I feel like sometimes we have these dissemination stations, and the end result is sort of and sad. I think this one's much more positive. Yeah, I think, very I think positive. we have, you know, we know we ha- have the technology, but I think we even have more knowledge of how we can. I hate talking about selling our science like it's some sort of a cheap commodity that you know we we need people to buy our snake oil. But there is that component of if people don't see a value in what we have to offer, they are not going to follow through. So as great as you know, preschool life skills is as good as the results we're seeing so far. And we, we, we still have questions about it. If we can't explain it to people or we can't get anyone else interested, mm-hmm. then it's just, you know, so many research articles that, hey, wouldn't this be a great system? Nah, nobody cares. You know, <laughs> I, I remember a couple of years back, I think we put it on the Facebook page. It wasn't even that long ago. Someone had gotten some huge grant enough that it was it was on like the Google feed on education or special education to figure out why children had challenging behavior and i said who's getting a grant on that we already know that yeah yeah but it wasn't a yeah. analyst so hey it was a different field where you know this poor person had never heard about this so that's sad though that we that was the question up. yeah we called them up we're like hey here's well, decades and decades of research you win <laughs> So if uh, in, in the reviews of the functional analysis literature, if the people that wrote those reviews had just put that, that language in there, causes of problem behavior or why do kids have problem behavior, maybe that person would have found that article when they were looking for it, you know, when they were, when they were hopefully doing their literature review. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. If they don't know to put in functional analysis, it's right? just... Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, Inner, it was such a pleasure having you on the show, talking more about, uh, I think, one of our, at least one of my favorite topics. I think we, you know, we're all pretty Mine positive about, about PLS or LS, wherever it's, whatever it ends up being called in the future. So thank you very, very much for taking the time to come and, and talk about uh, the research of, of you and your colleagues and other research. We, we really, really thank you for that. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yep. Do you have a contact information or any way that listeners could get in touch with you if they have further questions about this or... Any of the other areas that you are, are currently researching? Yeah, they can just email me. That's the easiest way. So uh, my email is just my first initial E and then my last name, Ingersen, at No big. Uh, <laughs> no big last name. Which you can hopefully see on the podcast description. Yep, exactly. Yes, it'll be there. It'll be there. <laughs> uh, so just E, my last name, and then it's at viaschool.org. So via V-I-A and then school.org. Well, we really hope you enjoyed this great time we had with Dr. Ingverson talking all about preschool life skills. Like like we said, it is literally one of our favorite topics. Mm-hmm. It I, is. It's, I think it's one of, the, one of the things that if I had to pick something in the literature that's not functional analysis <laughs> that I read the most about and then actually tried to use the most or replicated the most or talked about the most, it probably would be preschool life skills. So true. And then you from that it. kind of behavior skills training. It's very you true. I love it. I do. I love it. He's got a shirt that says, I love PLS and the P's in parentheses, depending on the student age. <laughs> yeah, once they come up once they come up with the final name, we'll make the we'll make the t shirts that say I love whatever it is. Whatever they finally call it. Oh boy. Ask me about my preschool life skills. <laughs> All right, before we go, I want to make sure everyone gets that second secret code word. It is Peanuts. P E A N U T S. Dumbo likes peanuts. If you like those Charlie Brown specials, guess what? They're actually peanuts. They're not called Charlie Jackie made a face like, what? I've never heard this before. If you're going to serve me peanuts, make sure they're honey roasted. Make sure they're honey roasted, baby. Peanuts. Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of ABA Inside Track. Once again, thanks to Dr. Anar Ingverson for being on the show and giving us all that awesome information about the research into PLS. Uh, I want to make sure to also thank all of you listeners out there. Maybe you found us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. We hope you've decided you liked us and want to subscribe. Maybe leave us a review or something to let us know how we're doing. A couple other ways you can get in contact with us. You can certainly go to our website, abainsidetrack.com. You can find us all over social media. We're on Pinterest. We're on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on somewhere else, in uh, Instagram. All as ABA Inside Track. Is it Pinterest? Yep, Diana's been putting up great visuals for each of our episodes. If you haven't seen those, you've got to check them out. They're awesome. And of course, you can always feel free to email us anytime at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. 
We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. 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 Bye.